Welcome back, uh, back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we're running a little bit late. So without much further ado, I introduce our next speaker. Um, now, Ansker, I know him from a long time ago. Uh, from the time we were students, he came over from Hong Kong on a dental exchange program. And then uh, years later, when I was hunting for a program in the US, um, I went to UCLA and I asked uh, the front desk um, for directions to the uh, Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. And they gave me certain directions and I went to this place and I knocked on the door. And the guy that opened the door was none other than Ansgar Ching. And uh, as, it, as it turned out, uh, the receptionist directed me to the Department of Maxillofacial Prosthetics. So anyway, I, uh, today Ansgar is here and he's part of the work group. And um, prior to coming to Singapore, he was the head of the Maxillofacial Prost Unit in um, uh, University of Toronto. So he has a lot of um, real life experience ma uh, managing patients who have gone through hair and neck irradiation uh, treatment. So I think he's the best person for the job, but uh, today he's not here to speak about uh, his expert opinion, but he's here to present the evidence on uh, dental implants in uh, irradiated bone. So Ansgar, please. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. How's everybody? Wow, you guys are very special because you come back after the tea break. <laughs> Usually people would not come back after the tea break or they will leave because they know I'm the next speaker. But anyway, thank you for coming. Um, today, um, there's a lot to cover, okay? And uh, usually I like to have the pet mic uh, doing this. I have to turn a little bit this way or that way. If you don't hear me well, please let me know, all right? Um, yes, my name is Ansgar, Ansgar Chang. Uh, Ansgar is a strange name, long name. If you don't know me, I'm AC, I'm not DC. All right, um, let's see. Okay, today we have a lot to cover, okay? Uh, when I was developing this, I realized there's only a 20 minute uh, presentation. However, when I was developing it more and more, then I realized that I have this compelling urge to create this into like a mini course on radiation therapy in the internet region. Um, why? The reason is this. Let me ask these questions. How many of you remember your teaching or your learning in radiation therapy in the internet region since BDS time? How many of you actually have been involved in these kind of patients? Okay, some of you, all right, but far in between. However, these patients are real, okay? And today we are trying to cover a couple of things uh, like um, radiation effect and impact on osteointegration, different modes of radiation therapy and chemo radiation, and also clinical study, animal study, human study, and osteoarthritis necrosis, hyperbaric oxygen, timing of placement, and the radiation of existing implants. Now, this is a lots of topics. Uh, I talked with Victor, who is the next speaker. I said, oh, shoot, you know, I'm, I'm going to overrun my, um, uh, my 20 minutes. And he said, no, Ansgar, you just keep going on. So, no X from him. Let's see, I have two pointers here. Okay, radiation effect. Let's revise a little bit what we should know. And that is that radiation basically reduces vas vasculature. Okay, you have scar tissue formation. Um, you have reduction in the, bone, in the periosteal cells and loss of vasculature. Now you remember I talked about vasculature twice. What am I talking about here? So if you think of the mandible, you have two sources of blood supplies, your ID nerve, your ID canal, there's one area which is from inside out. The other blood supply is from periosteum. So loss of uh, uh, vasculature is not only loss of the blood supply from the ID canal, but also loss of vasculature from the periosteum. And mind you, when we are doing per, uh, um, implants, many times you have to raise a full, uh, full thickness flap. As a result, the periosteum is detached from the bone, so we are further depriving the blood supplies. So what's the big deal? The problem is that we see this, okay? When there's scar tissue in sufficient cells, bone cells, loss of vasculature, then basically we will have these kind of bone necrosis. Bone necrosis, we see it all the time, okay? All right, like this one is a spontaneous uh, 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 osteoarthritis necrosis as a result of a 7,000 centigrade of radiation therapy to the anterior mandible. Okay, so the question is this, in these kind of cases, what happened to the implant anchorage? Are they mechanical or are they biological? 
what do I mean? Okay. Well, when you think of the Aussie integration definition, originally we were talking about direct bone implant contact. There's not much to discuss the behavior of the bone versus the titanium surface. Now, the later definition, we talk about being a remodeling viable interface. However, on the radiograph, on an everyday basis, we can't tell if the interface is viable until it fails. All right? Problem is that when we have all those changes, response to infection will be poor, remodeling will be poor, okay? And response to occlusal forces will be compromised. And worst case scenario is that we have osteolytic activities, which is loss of osteointegration. The question is then, shall implants be considered at all? All right? You think of it, I was born in Hong Kong, I grew up there. Now I'm in Singapore. Hong Kong and Singapore share many common things, okay? And one thing is that we are both well champions in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Yes, lucky. Well, those patients usually, they will have high dose radiation therapy with a broad field. Okay, a loss of the hand neck structure, maxilla mandible will be involved. As a result, a loss of the bones will be in, in, involved in the radiation therapy. And those patients have stereostomia. They lose the teeth as a result. Okay, when we see people who have no teeth, as dentists, what do we do? We try to fix teeth. For those who have implants in the tooth box, what do they do? They implant those teeth. And if we implant it in these cases, sometimes we are running into risks that we do not know that we're running into. First thing first, we try to understand what are radiation therapy. There are different modes of radiation therapy, okay? Don't try to read the slides because I do have typos, we do have all, the, all kinds of problems. But basically, we have conventional radiation therapy. Basically, very simple, you have one beam or two beams, okay? Target volume, say maybe in the uh, posterior mandible, okay? We try to reach a certain tumorocytal dose. If it's a definitive, that means a treatment dose, usually it could be up to 7,000 centigrade. Centigrade is the new unit for the old measurement of RADs, R-A-D, okay? So 7,000 units could be up to 7,000 units. If it's a post-operative, that means if this, uh, there's a surgery before and it's only adjunctive uh, radiation therapy, it could be above five to 6,000 centigrade, okay? So we need to know this. These are the basic information that we have to understand. And lately, we have this IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy. The idea is very, very simple. Instead of using one or two big beams, we have multiple small beams focused in the target volume. By doing so, we spare more of the normal tissue. For example, in this case, it's a nasal pharyngeal area. What happens is that the skull, which is where the brain is, and it will be shielded off, anterior maxilla, anterior mandible shielded off by a lead shield. So in this patient, the teeth or the oral cavity has unmeaningful level of radiation therapy, okay? And this is so-called a port film, okay? This is so-called port film. So if you see a patient like this, you need to call the radiation th oncologist and say, hey, show me the port films. They should have them in the record. It's almost like OPGs, all right? Intensity modulated radiation therapy, basically, again, by different kind of fields, different kind of directions, then we uh, 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 elevate the treatment volume, the, the dosage to the treatment volume to the desired level, and then the other structures, like in here, the anterior maxilla, will be spared, okay? So that's the advantage of that. We can do this because of some computer technology, some fancy calculations. Apart from this, we have this thing called a chemoradiation therapy. Chemoradiation therapy, basically very simple. Whatever is radiation therapy, combined with chemotherapy at the same time. Very, very, very new, okay, experimental, probably less than 20 years, actual clinical practice, probably less than 15 years. Some people does it in Singapore, not all, okay, some oncologists does this, some radiation, uh, 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 radiation oncologists and, uh, and medical oncologists does it at the same time. The problem is that with the chemotherapy, then the effective dosage of the radiation will go up by approximately 15%. So if it's a 6,000 centigrade dosage, it becomes a 7,000 centigrade dosage. 7,000 centigrade dosage becomes an 8,000 centigrade dosage. That's a biological effect, all right? Earlier we talked about centigrade, reds. Why do we have different names? Because it's a different uh, measurement of the biological response. So it's not just a physical or uh, physics kind of measurement, but rather the biological response.